heart-wrenching. I mean, it's just incredible when you think about it like that. He gave his only begotten son to save the rest of his children. That's pretty big. I mean, that's big. That's huge. So, um, anyway, I, I had been praying about something that was really on my mind, and I shot a note to Pastor Lord to, pray, to be praying for me, and I've been praying that this person who's very, very close to me had, it had hurt me really badly, and um, I've been praying for them over and over for the Lord to just convict their hearts, convict their hearts, Lord. He blessed blessings on their head, give them the desires of their heart. I just kept praying for them over and over. And Monday, I'm sitting in my recliner, and I'm just admiring the enormity of God, and he just dropped in my soul that I was to forgive them. And so it completely released me, right? So rather than me praying for them to be convicted, he's like, why don't you get aligned in my word? Don't worry about, don't worry about what I'm doing over here. You get an alignment, and I'll take yes. care of you. Because he calls us to forgive, right? You have to forgive because we've forgiven. And so, while that's not easy, and I'm praying through that, and you know, Lord, help me to forgive this person. Help me to um, forgive them. I forgive them over and over and over. But that's true with any circumstance. If you're having marital issues, stop worrying about your spouse and get yourself in alignment wow. with the word, what the word tells you to do or be as a wife or as a husband. And then it just falls into place, and that's very releasing. Anyway, I wanted to share that little testimony. No, it was just two things. Big God and forget it. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He is a big God, isn't he? Amen. And he has all this to forgive, and that's not always easy. Sometimes it's a process for us to get through. So um, I just wanted to share one more thing, and we're gonna use, I'm going to pray and get into service. If you walked in the door um, back there, you probably about stumbled over some apples and potatoes, a box of onions, and then in the refrigerator that's in our kids' classroom, there's some other items that needs to be kept cold. So uh, if any of you guys can use that, please take that home, okay? Because we don't have a place to keep that really. And so we got blessed with that today, so we want to bless our church family with that today. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, you are a big God. And you have forgiven us big. Yeah. You have forgiven us big. And you have loved us enough to send your son. Father, so I pray that, that as that word was spoke, as that word was spoke tonight, Lord, maybe, maybe it, uh, it tugged at some of our hearts even right now before you even go into service. That that's what we need to do, Father. And I know I've been in that, that process, that pattern, whatever you want to call it, several different helped me to get there. Sometimes I've had to open my ears really wide and listen and get out of what I think and, and, and my response and let my will be laid down so that I can be in your perfect will. Is to, and that is to walk in completeness and wholeness. So Father, I pray right now, before we even go any farther, Lord, if there's somebody uh, watching online or in this room that, that knows that that's something that you need to do. I pray that they will they will let their selves down, their response, their self, why they feel that way, their excuses to your feet and pick up forgiveness and walk through the process of being able to do that because yes. it is free. It changes everything. Thank you, Jesus. Father, have your way in this house tonight. Ask your anointing on this service, Lord. Father, I know Pastor Ronnie has Get your word and spend time with you hard today, Lord, so that he can deliver your word to us. Teach us your ways, Father God, so we'll walk only in your truth. Let us be a light in the dark world, Father. We just praise you and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.
Oh 
Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were, felt, were afraid and gave glory to the Lord God. Okay. The God of heaven, sorry. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. When the seven angels sounded, and there was loud voices in the heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. 17 saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who lives and who was and who is to come, yes, because Lord. you have taken your great power and reigned. 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has become, and the time of the, the dead that they should be judged, and that you shall should reward your servants, the prophets of the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the earth of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there was lightning, noises, thundering, and earthquake, and a great hail. Amen. 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 She's a pro. Yes. yes. Good job, Lisa. Thank you, young lady. Y'all can be seated. The end of another major section of the book. That's where we're at. Next week, the whole perspective of the book that we're reading, Revelation, is going to change. The whole scene is going to shift. We'll begin the story from a brand new angle next week. But we're wrapping up this portion. It'll make sense in a bit. I mean, you know, there's a ton of stuff. If you've read Revelation 11, there is a ton in it. Yes, there is. Yeah. A lot going on in Revelation 11. Matter of fact, many commentators say that this is the most complicated chapter in the book. I wish Pastor Josh would have taught it. He'd have done so much better than me, probably. But Pastor Josh is out tonight. He's um, celebrating with friends and things going on. And I'm excited about it for him. You got it, Pastor. Um, but hang on tight. Because there's a lot to unpack here tonight, and I'm going to do the best that I can to make it as simple as I can for us. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you that it's established and it's true. And Father, I just ask you that you would uh, give us all wisdom, Father, in this room, that, that we would understand your word tonight. Yes. Father, that you would bring it. Um, to our understanding. Father, I ask you to um, let it flow like rivers of living water in this place up out of my belly tonight, God, that I would be your mouthpiece tonight. Father, that you would use me. Father, that I would just move Donnie out of the way and, and let you speak through my mouth. Father, your thoughts would become my thoughts. Hmm. Have your way in us tonight, God. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 So Revelation chapter 11 is the second part of an interlude. We talked about last week this interlude, um, Revelation 10 and 11, right in the middle of these trumpets going on. And he's just like he pushed pause and he's like, here, I want to interject this right here so I can get you on the right track. Praise God. Chapters 10 and 11 is this intervening period of time to alter or change the course of events. That's what's going on here. Don't already get lost. Somebody say amen. 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 Just to refresh us again, remember from Revelation 6 up to now, there have been seven seals and six trumpets blown. And they overlap, they intertwine. Tonight we're going to talk about when we get to the seventh trumpet. Also remember, not only do these things overlap, but they're getting stronger. They're intensifying. Yeah. He's doing that on purpose. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to keep people's, he's trying to get people's attention. And so they're getting more intense. Things are getting more intense. God's trying to show man that he's coming. Yeah. Amen? Oh, man. Yes. yes. He's coming. Over and over, he's trying to get man's attention. 
He's patient. Yes, he it's his will that as many as possible will repent. That's his will. As each one of us are definitely a huge part of his plan. <clears throat> However, God's trying to show us that our best efforts aren't enough to fix what's broken. We can't do it. But he can do it through us. And he wants to. He wants to use us to fix what's broken. He, that's why he's waiting, I believe. He's waiting on things as long as he can. He's been patient, trying to get as many as will to repent. Yes. And that's the only, to me, in my mind, that's the only thing that's kept him from coming already. Yeah. <coughs> we can't do it. No. But he can't do us. Yeah. And that's the point of all of this. Everything that we're reading in Revelation 11, I think that's the point. He's saying, you, you can't do this on your own, but I can do it through you. The intensifying of world events, natural disasters, and even spiritual warfare are all signaling us to the fact yeah. that somewhere the human race has taken a wrong turn. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> and if you couldn't say amen anywhere else, you could say amen right there. We know the world we live in is a jacked up mess. <laughs> and it's because we've jacked it up. Come on, we want to blame it on others, but listen, we've been we've taken our part. Come right. Come on. Uh-huh. We're broken. We desperately need some kind of change of course. That's for sure. And he's patiently waiting. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. He's trying to show us that the only way to find peace and security and abundant life that we're all chasing is to turn back to our Creator. And let him redeem us. Come on. Mm -hmm. good. So good. He wants to redeem us. He wants to redeem the world we live in. <coughs> the seals are already broken. Yeah. Come on. We find ourselves in the middle of revelation of what's going on. Right. Things are already happening. God doesn't want us to read revelation like we watch the news. Come on. Come. He wants us to see our place. Or our part in it. He, he wants us to see what he wants us to see. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Because we all have a big part to play. Yes. God's given the church a major role in the restoration of all things. Come on, nobody wants to say amen there because it obligates us, right? Yeah. Come on. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's given the church a major role in the restoration of all things. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible reality to think about. He wants to use us. Mm -hmm. He calls us, the church, to work alongside him in the restoration of his you know, they're not just sinners. They're his people. Yes. Yes. They're his people. Amen. And we have a high calling. Yes. Yes, we do. I want you to see that tonight. No one in the room tonight is unemployed. Right. Amen. 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 That's good. It doesn't matter what you do for Come a living. Mm -hmm. Come on. You're not unemployed in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank Jesus. Okay, so we're going to walk through this together. We're going to walk through these three questions together. I have three simple questions I'm going to ask, and we're going to walk through them together. We're going to spend a lot of time, listen to me, a lot. We're going to spend a lot of time on the first one. So don't get discouraged. Don't think, oh my gosh, he's still on number one. I've got two more. No, we're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of time on the first one. But the other two, the, the second and third one, are going to go real quick. So don't get discouraged when I've spent a lot of time on the first one. It's going to take a while. Okay? Yeah, come on. Don't freak out thinking I'm taking too long. But it's going to take a minute. 
According to Revelation 11, these three questions. <coughs> Who are we? Number two, why are we here? And number three, where is this all leading? Wow. Seems simple enough. Number one, who are we? <clears throat> Let's again let his word set the scene for us. I'm just gonna wanna read back through it a little bit at a time and then talk about it. So verse one, if you don't have your Bible open yet, you can open it. Revelation 11, verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot. For 42 months. So, in this interlude, this chapter begins with John being given a measuring rod and being told to measure the temple, the altar, and all the people who worship there. So what's going on here? First, we have to understand that throughout the book of Revelation, there's almost 500 references. The book of Revelation references back to the Old Testament almost 500 times. And that's what's going on here. So, Zechariah, chapter 2. I just want to read it. You don't have to go there for time's sake. Just trust me. You can look it up later. Zechariah 2, verses 1 and 2. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the width and what is the length. In Revelation 11, John is the one now holding the measuring rod. Why? What's the point in that? What's, what's the point of him having a measuring rod? We read the text, and there's no measurements given. He said, measure, here, take this, measure these things, but there's no measurements given. So what's the point in measuring it if he's not going to tell us what the measurements were? <laughs> measurements are important. We got a couple of guys. i I mean, Charles, I know if you asked Charles tonight, he would say measurements are important. I mean, maybe more so in his job than most because he's, he has a trim business. He, he trims houses, and I mean, you've got to get it close. There's a little bit of wiggle room, maybe. I don't know, but he don't act like it. <laughs> when I trim something, I, I mean, I, I leave the paint or something to cock in, and he don't do that. He thinks measurements are important. Amen. Right. Measurements are important. Come on. When you read a measurement, it's a good thing to remember the number. And I'm not very good at that. I don't even sometimes know what the number is. <laughs> measurements are important. So why no measurements given here? It's because the measurements themselves aren't actually the point. Are you following me? The measurement themselves is not the point. It doesn't matter. I mean, he would say it would. But it does not matter here in this story. The point here is simply that the measurements are taken. Mm -hmm. Again, it's explained back in Zechariah 2. In verses 3 through 5, it says... And there was an angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Towns without walls. Somebody said towns without walls. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her and will be the glory in her midst. So it doesn't matter. There's no measure to take. He's just saying, I'm going to be a wall all around you. A wall all around you. God is reassuring his church that he is a wall of fire all around them. Despite the fact 
that things are unraveling around us, how many of you know tonight we are completely secure in him? Yes. Because he says, it doesn't matter what the measurement is, if it were to set 10 feet or 75 feet, really doesn't matter because whatever that measurement is, I'm going to be a wall of fire all around you. So we don't need to know how big it is. We don't need to know what the measurements are. Just know I'm all around you. Jesus. That's good. All around us. We're completely secure. That's the point. God has taken the measurement of his people, and not a single one of them will be lost. Wow. Not one. Thank you. <clears throat> if you remember back in chapter 7, the exact, the exact same thing happened there. To belong to Jesus is to be sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Remember, it was sealing the church. We can be secure in the fact that he's all around us. I'm not sure we really understand that. What about the fact that John was told not to measure the outer court? Let's talk about that. Numbers in the Bible are symbols. Some of y'all got it all figured out, smarter than me, know all the numbers and what everything means. Numbers in the Bible are symbols. In Numbers 33, just jot these things down. You can go back and look at it. It's pretty cool. There's probably more that I didn't find. But in Numbers 33, the Bible lists Israel's journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. It was 42 places that they stayed on their journey. 42. Remember that number, 42. It was 42 places that they stayed on their journey. So as they come out of Egypt, they stayed, blah, 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 they stayed, blah, blah, they stayed, blah, 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 42 times to get to the promised land. 42. In Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus is given in three groups of 14, which equals 42. I'm not going to take time to read all that. I've got 14 pages of notes besides. So you just have to go back and read that. 14, three groups of 14, which equals 42. So they listed 42. Some commentators say that they actually left some names out just to make it equal 42. But it's in here, okay? It's the Word of God. lists 42. I don't care what someone else might say or how many they left out. It doesn't matter to me. It lists 42. 42. Matthew 1, 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity of, of Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. Equals 42 generations. Wow. The number 42 is significant. 42 represents, listen, 42 represents the fullness of time in redemptive history. fullness of time. 1260 days, 300, I mean three and a half years. I like this one. Time, times, and a half time. That's like 10 plus 20 plus time, times, and a half time. How it is. 42 months. All of those are the same time frame. All of them equal the same thing. Are y'all tracking? Yes. The outer court will be trampled for 42 months. That tells us that the church, though measured by God, ultimately secure in his hand, will be under increasing pressure and persecution until the day that Jesus returns. In other words, Jesus' church simultaneously, if I said the word right, simultaneously, is 
invincible? Yes. Aren't you glad? Yes. yes. And very vulnerable. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. wow. For 42 months, Christians will live like lambs in the midst of wolves. And we aren't called to fight back. Mm. We aren't called to even defend ourselves. We aren't even called to stick up for our own rights. Come on. We're called to imitate our king. So I know you're quiet right there. We're called to walk in the way of the lamb. That's what this whole passage is about. The role that God called us to play because of who he made us to be. So back to the first question, who are we? The answer is found in the next verse. Look at Revelation 11, verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,200 and 60 days clothed in sackcloth. Who are these two witnesses? They're called to prophesy through the whole 42 months. Revelation verse, I mean, chapter 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees of the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Lampstands and olive trees. All through scripture, all of trees represent God's covenant people. <clears throat> Remember back to Revelation 1. I'm going to stretch some of you here in just a minute. Just don't throw no eggs. <laughs> Remember back in Revelation 1, the lampstand represented the local church. Yep. So, all of trees represent God's covenant people, and lampstands represent the local church. So if you put it all together, who do we have here? It makes a pretty strong case that these two witnesses are representations of Jesus' church. But why two of them? Why if it's a representation of this church, why would there be two and not just one? Why do we have, why do we see two? Why not just one if it's just a symbol? For a couple of reasons. This is why, I believe. First, in ancient Israel, a church could only be legally verified if there were at least two witnesses. Oh, wow. That's good. That's good. Remember, even we quote it here, where two or three are gathered, yeah. makes a church. Yeah. yeah. Second. Both the old and new covenant people are represented in two witnesses. That's good. That's good. Meaning, ancient Israel, those who belong to God and the church today, the entire church is represented through those two witnesses. Wow. Who are we? We're witnesses. Amen. Right, but that ain't all we are. That, that's not all. That's, that's not all we are. I want to learn some more. Let's go on. Witnesses show up when someone is on trial. How many of you know that? You ever been to court? Surely somebody in this place has been to court. Oh, boy. <laughs> Witnesses show up when someone's on trial. Evidence is being weighed. Witnesses come in. They give their opinion. They give their testimony, their side of the story. They try to sway the evidence of the opinion in one way or the other. And for the witnesses, who's on trial? Jesus. Amen. Jesus is on trial. Yeah. Remember we saw in Revelation 10, God's focus is repentance. That's why he's filled the world with witnesses. To live as Jesus, witnesses, so, sorry, to live as Jesus' witness is to live as the embodiment of the love of God. To live as Jesus' witness. Come on, that's a major statement. Yes. 
to live as Jesus' witness is to live as the embodiment of his love. Remember also, the witnesses prophesy. They prophesy. For the whole time frame. Come on. They declare his word. With our lives and our mouths, the two witnesses also were clothed in sackcloth. Why is that important? I hope you're getting something. Throughout scripture, sackcloth represents two things primarily. The role or the office of the prophet. Another thing that sackcloth always represented was repentance. The witnesses of Jesus are men and women who live lives of continual repentance. That's so important. We can't just overlook it. We can't just why buy it? Why repentance? Sometimes we think repentance is something that we do for God instead of something that he does for us. Yes. Come on, we think repentance is our part. No, repentance was given to us. It was a gift. Repentance was a gift to us that we can give to him. Thank you, yes. Amen. Hmm. If we see if we think that it's about us, if we think it's our gift to him, if we think that repentance is something we give to him, listen to me, if we see it that way, we'll continually feel like a failure. Yeah. If we have to keep going to confess, keep going to repent of our sins, we might begin to feel like repentance is not working because, man, I've repented of this before. I, I've laid this down before ten times ago. I, I've done it again, and I, here I am again at the altar repenting again. If we think that it's something we're just giving to him, we'll become weary. Come on, so we end up in this cycle of trying to prove to him that this time we're really sorry. will always lead to the same place if we live like that. Spiritual burnout. Because you can't do it. You can't handle it. You, you weren't created that way. You can't be good enough for him. Are you hearing me? You can't be good enough for him. You can't ever get to the place that you walk in here and lay down at the altar and get up on your own good enough. He gave you that gift. He gave you the gift of repentance. He's the one that draws you. You don't draw him. You don't run him down. He's running you down. God's good gift of repentance has made, has been turned into pain and penance. It's turned our pain into penance if we try to do it on our own. Yeah. There's a huge difference between repentance and pain penance. Mm. There's a huge difference. Biblical repentance is primarily what we do for God. Isn't primarily what we do for God. It's what he's done for us. I can't talk. Sorry, I jumbled up in these notes. Biblical repentance isn't primarily what we do for God. It's what he's done for us. He gave us that gift through his life, through his death, through his resurrection. Because of him, we can repent. Repentance is the continual acknowledgement that the gospel is true. When I try to measure my life up to this, there's always room somehow. For me to repent. Come on. That's good. That's so good. Jesus. There's no greater witness than the church running back to him in repentance. Do you understand that? Yes. I think sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we think we have to act like we've got it all together, but there's no greater witness to the world around us than showing them, you know what? I'm not perfect. He is. And he loves me anyway. Amen. 
The church clothed in sackcloth. That's the gospel. The only, the only way to kill sin and become more Christ-like is to fall more in love with him. Amen. That's it. The only way to become more Christ-like is to fall more in love with him. Sin only dies when we love him more than we love our sin. Good. So confess your sin to God and to one another. And as you do, sin will lose its grip on you. Mm -hmm. Who are we? We're joyfully repentant, prophetic witnesses of Jesus. I'm not done yet. Sorry. I told you, number one, it's going to take a while. Revelation 11, 4, I already read it once, but I want to read it again. There are the two olive trees. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. We have to see this one more piece. It's important that we see this. And then I'm going to move on from point number one. But I don't want to pass by this. I want you to see. Zechariah, it's also there. Chapter 4 of Zechariah, verses 2 and 3. So I said, I'm looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl, and the other at its left. So there's a lampstand with an olive tree on each side. If the lampstands we're seeing in Revelation 11 is the witnessing church, where's the source of our light? Where does our light come from? Not our willpower. Not our good works. Not our obedience. Not even our passion. He goes on to say in Zechariah 4, verse 6, So he said, he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Mm. Y'all know this one. Not by might, nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Mm. Amen. The source of our witness is the power of the Holy Spirit. He's wow. the source. He's the source. He's the light. I pray that we would see all of that and just feel the weight lift off of us. Because you don't have to perform. It's not by your mind. It's not by your will. It's not by your power. It's by His Spirit. And if you'll live like that, oh, <laughs> you can live free. We're not the ones who make it happen. It's Holy Spirit. He's the oil. He's the oil. Our job is to lean on Him. Okay, let's look at verses 5 and 6. I promise I'm moving on. Revelation 11, 5 and 6. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Now remember who we are. We've talked about who we are. Remember the witnesses, the two witnesses. That's who's, that's who's been talked about here. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Have y'all seen water turn to blood lately? And if we're the witnesses, if we're the church, if that's referring to us, one of those witnesses represents
representing us, the modern day church, has anyone seen water turn to blood? Has anyone called plagues down lately? Mm -hmm. And that's what it's saying. If someone messes with you, just you got the power to do this. He's highlighting the ministries of Moses and Elijah. God wants to accomplish in us what he did in them. I don't believe he wants us to go around calling down plagues. I mean, he used Moses to do that to free the Israelites. Elijah shut up heaven for three and a half years, the 42 months that it didn't rain. Remember? That's what it's been talked, that's what's been talked about here. Why? Why does God want to accomplish in us what he did in them? Why? Why does he want to do it? Why is this significant to us? Come on, that's good. Really good. I need to step outside. Just I'm not going on, but I need to step outside for a second and point. Come on. It's for their freedom. It's for their freedom. That's why. Hmm. Are you tracking with me? Do you understand that? He said Moses to do those things for the freedom yeah. of Israel. He used those plagues. He used those miracles that he performed there for freedom. And he's saying today in that scripture to us, I want to use this in your life. I want to use this time in your life. I want your witness to stand so strong that somebody's freed by it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hmm. If that's who we are, why are we here? Number two. Why are we here? There's two answers. Okay. I don't have much further to go. We... We've been through, the, well, I'm on the 11th page, and I've got 14. Stay with me. Stay with me. Revelation 11, verses 7 through 10. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, are you listening to me? Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. Make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Hmm. They're going to throw a party. It's saying they're, they're going to celebrate when they see that day come because they were tormented, tormented by the prophets. Hmm. We're joyfully hmm. repentant, prophetic, spirit empowered witnesses of Jesus. Amen. That's who we are. That means that our lives have been given for us to be poured out. Yes, amen. 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 That's so good. Your life is not yours. Your life's been given to you to be poured out. That's right, amen. Wow, that's good. Why are we here? To die. Yeah. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it kind of seems depressing, but I want you to wait a minute. We see a beast. Just kind of introduced there. We'll learn more about that. Later, I'm not going to take a lot of time on that. We're going to see lots more about that to come. We see people celebrating the death of the witnesses. I believe, I really do believe that that's happening right now. I believe if, if the church died right now, I think the world we live in would have a party. 
I think we see it happening. I, I think we see that being prepped right now. Not everyone will celebrate what we have to say. Get your feelings off your shoulders. Quit worrying about it. The Bible's clear in telling us they're going to throw a party when you're dead. They don't want to know what you have to say, but some will. Some will. It's not up to you to separate. You just harvest. Mm. We must love the world and seek peace. But we'll be hated at times for our witness. Listen, we cannot see the promises of God as long as our lives are the most precious things to us. I don't know if you just heard me. I want you to get that. We cannot see the promises of God as long as our lives are the most precious thing to us. We don't understand what God's promises. We won't understand what God promises in the gospel as long as our priority is this life. We're called to pour out our lives until there is nothing left. Jesus, help us, Lord. We're not only here to die, but before we get depressed, we need to keep reading. The second part of why we're here. Verses 11 and 12. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. Hallelujah. Yes. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! Mm-hmm. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. Yeah. Reminds me of the other verse that says, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. In the same way that we're to imitate him in his death, we're to imitate him in his resurrection. Death is at the end for us. Eternity awaits you. It awaits us. Eternity is awaiting. We may go through some things momentarily, but they won't compare to the glory. Amen? Amen. Now after these three and a half Days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. I gotta get the word, just a second. I mean, it's the last book here, Donald. You can do it. Jesus. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God in heaven. The second was passed. Behold, the third is coming quickly. The earth will shake. And at that moment, at that moment, everyone will see the truth. Mm-hmm. Well. Jesus, but it'll be too late. Because yeah. he's not coming back yeah. as a lamb. He's coming as a lion. Mm-hmm. It's too late. That grieves me. It grieves me that people will still be unrepentant. But they'll see the truth. They're going to see him for who he is. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11 says, That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, at that moment, it's too late. Who are we? We're joyfully repentant, Prophetic, spirit-empowered witnesses of Jesus. Why are we here? We're here to die, and we're here to rise. Mm -hmm. Last question. 
where is this all leading? Finally, let's look at the blowing of the second, of the seventh and last trumpet. We've been waiting for this for a little while. It's been two or three chapters ago that we've seen the trumpets blowing and it got this interlude injected. Revelation 11, verses 15 through 19, then the seventh angel sounded. And there was loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, mm. O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. And should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant has seen was seen in his temple. And there was lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and a great hail. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. Next week we're going to see this story start over again from a totally different perspective. But right now, this is ending the story. We're standing here right now reading the end. But for right now, we need to see that that's where we're headed. That's where we're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The coming kingdom of God. I thought somebody might get excited right there. <laughs> it's all going to end someday, and then we're going to spend eternity there. Yeah. In the coming kingdom of God. Yeah. Our lives have been given to us to bring the end of the story to pass. To live, die, and rise as spirit-empowered witnesses of God. That's why your life has been given to you. That's why you wake up every day. That's why he keeps blowing breath in your lungs. It's so you can live, die, and rise as spirit-empowered witnesses of him. He's written us into his story as main characters. Would y'all look at me? Would y'all listen? He's written us into his story as main characters. We're the two witnesses clothed in sackcloth. We're living single-mindedly for the kingdom of Jesus. That's who we are. Do we fall short? Yes. I hope you would say yes. 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 We fall short. <laughs> knowing that is what draws us to repentance. Knowing that we fall short. Knowing that we can't do it. Knowing that we mess up and that we can't walk this thing on our own is what draws us to repentance. Which is what gives us our witness. I want you to see some things tonight. I'm wrapping up with this. I want you to see, because really the only exhortation in that whole chapter is look. Look. I want you to see that your God is a consuming fire all around you. Hallelujah. I want you to see that God has made you to be his witness. Look and see. I think it is so amazing how God does things. I had no idea if Kim was going to turn to Mrs. Michael and say what she said to me. When she got down, I said, come here and look at this. I mean, I'm, I'm in it. I'm five lines from being done. 
We started with this. The Rukia. Well, it was really the Holy Ghost, but. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty. I, I know what the Bible says to not add to or take away from his word. And I'm not doing that. I don't want you to think, oh, that preacher put some word in there and he say what he wanted. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I die before I do that. But I want you to listen. God so loved the world that he gave or sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus mm -hmm. yes. because he loved the world. Yes, he did. So I want to read it again. God so loved the world that he gave, sent his only begotten son. We all know that verse. Let me also say this. This isn't scripture. I'm not quoting it as scripture. But I want to say this. God so loved the world that he gave and sent you. I'm not taking away from that he sent his son. That's the only way. But at this point in the game, he sent us. He said, go. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever lives in him, believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you. But Jesus left and left us in charge. Mm. That's right. And he said, go. Yep. That's right. So now, for today, God so loved the world that he gave you. Yes. Wow. Jesus. River of Faith Church. Yes. Amen. He's gave you. God, use us. Yes. Use us in a mighty way, Father. Amen. In your end time. Father, I know that you have a plan. I know you have a purpose in everything that we go through, God. I ask you, Father, that we wouldn't be soft. Father, that our skin wouldn't be soft. But that our hearts would. Help us love people. Father, I know it's your desire, it's your will for repentance. God, use us. Help us stop being selfish. Let us be poured out. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Have your way in us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for enduring 14 pages of Donnie's notes. I love you guys. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good.